Wow. How many are receiving something here today? Amen. How many know how important this is in our history right now, where we're at? I just want to give some opening remarks to kind of generalize uh, this conference and how important it is. And I hope you understand the spirit in which we are coming here today. It's been said, but it must be reiterated. As God's people, we are not anarchists. We are not rebels. And for any government on the planet, if they have Christians in their midst, they will not find better citizens that will respect and honor their authority if they use it lawfully. Amen? We are not here promoting civil disobedience. We are here promoting biblical obedience, and there's a big difference in those sayings. Here's our problem. Much evil has been codified into law. As a result, it is our government that has become the law breaker. But we as God's people, as Christians, we must, especially in these times, remain the law keeper. Much has been said about tyranny. How do God's people respond when you live in the days where your chains are being forged by tyranny. How many know the Bible addresses this? Just read 1 Peter chapter, I mean the whole uh, book of 1 Peter. God has a remedy and he even has a charge to us as Christians how we biblically submit to a government that becomes tyrannical. And the word of God tells us two things when you're living under a tyrannical government. Ready? Number one, say it with me. Trust God. And number two, and this is vitally important, continue to do good. Even, this is critical, even when the state considers your good a crime against the state. You trust God and you continue to, to, to do good. We have, you have seen scriptures up here from the apostles teaching us that we must obey civil authority, right? The apostle Paul gave us the, uh, the admonishment. The apostle Peter gave us the admonishment, honor the king, obey civil authority. And here's the crux of the matter. Each and every one of those men died at the hands of civil government. Are they hypocrites? Did they contradict the very word of God they told us to obey? What did they know that somehow in the American church has just been off the screens for decades? Simply this. When the law of men countermands or contravenes the law of God, we must obey God rather than men. And brothers and sisters, those men are dead, and it's our turn now. It's simply, this is what you have to, you, 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 you have to absorb the time we are in. It's our turn now. All these things that you've read in the Bible all these years, all the things you read in history, all the struggles of the church, it's our turn now. You've got to settle that in your heart. You've got to cross that line of obedience. And you've got to get over two things, the suffering issue and the death issue. you just got to get over it. You're going to suffer for two reasons. 
You're going to suffer for doing what's wrong as a consequence of your sin. And you're going to suffer for doing what's right. But God says if we suffer as Christians, then his spirit and his glory rests upon us. Amen? Our brothers have uh, addressed some of the fruit of our problems and some remedies to the fruits of our problems. Now, I want to delve in to the very root of our woe. Some of you may be familiar with this doctrine, but just like a lot of things in Western civilization, we've lost a lot of understanding and a lot of true doctrines of the Bible through the modernization of this world. And this doctrine is called the doctrine of blood guiltiness. How many has ever heard the doctrine of blood guiltiness? How many has not? Raise your hand if you've not heard the doctrine of blood guiltiness. Well, I want you to saddle up, okay, because we got a lot of places to go in the scripture in a short time to get there. So open your Bibles to Genesis chapter 4. This is the first passage of scripture that establishes the doctrine of blood guiltiness. You all know the fall of man, and you all know the first sin and the first crime that was committed was an act of murder. And in verse 8 of chapter 4, the scripture says this, Now Cain talked with Abel, his brother, and it came to pass that when they were in the field, that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and killed him. And the Lord said to Cain, where is Abel, your brother? And he said, I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? Can we say that together? Am I my brother's keeper? And how many know that question has served to haunt and torment God's people through the centuries? Especially when a tyrant or a group of tyrants rise up and target people for oppression and murder. How many know that saying right from the book of Genesis comes right back to confront us? Are we our brother's keeper? And he said, what have you done? This is speaking of God now. What have you done the voice of your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. So now you are cursed from the earth, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood. This is the first instance in the creation where the first crime and the first sin is committed. And it brings about the shedding of innocent blood. And there's a few things we need to take note of. Notice, first of all, it doesn't say that God saw the blood. What does it say? He heard. What did he hear? He said he heard the voice of that blood. He heard it. So this is what you have to understand. When, we, when we're talking about the doctrine of blood guiltiness, we're talking specifically about the shedding of innocent blood. And when it is shed, and when it goes into the ground, there is a voice, and that voice carries a message to the ears of a holy and a just God. And what is the essence of the plea? What is the essence of the cry? From the book of Genesis all the way through the book of Revelation, there is a response, and you can find it in Revelations chapter 6, when the martyrs, those that are being beheaded for the cause of Christ, they're crying out to God, Thou who are holy, just, and true, how long, O oh God, do you not avenge our blood that has been spilt in the earth? This is the void, this is the plea, and this is the message that goes before God when a people or a nation sheds 
innocent blood. You know why we are in trouble today? Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. Go to Genesis chapter 9. This is after Noah. The flood comes. You know the preconditioned flood. Men are thinking continually all the time. We're violent. We're perverted. We were so bad that it grieved the heart of God that he even made us. And the first thing that happens when Noah gets off the boat, this is what God says to him. Whoever sheds man's blood by man, civil government, his blood shall be shed. For in the image of God, he made man. People don't understand the crucial importance of civil government biblically. There are two main reasons why God established civil government. A, he didn't want us to resort back to the preconditioned wickedness before the flood. We ain't going back there no more. So I'm instituting civil government to protect this earth from resorting back to that kind of brutality and evil and wickedness. It was a protective act on the behalf of Almighty God. But number two, the very purpose for civil government, get this, is to protect life and to stop the shedding of innocent blood. Well, of course, in 1973, our brilliant lawmakers, I'm, I don't get lawmakers, uh, whatever those people are up there. <laughs> Jeremiah, what's the term, brother? <laughs> Magistrates. Roe versus Wade. And with that act and with that ruling, our government betrayed its sacred trust. And the floodgates of evil have descended upon us. And now our government uses that sword that is supposed to protect the good and punish the evil, that sword right now is protecting murderers who are butchering God's babies, his little image bearers in the womb, shedding innocent blood, and will punish Christians who act to save their lives. And guess what? The same thing's going to happen with homosexual marriage. You know what the Lord says about this? Especially when you're dealing with sexual immorality that leads to child sacrifice. Just read Leviticus chapter 18, and this is what he says. He says, do not defile yourself with any of these things, for by all these things the nations are defiled, which I'm casting out before you. For the land is defiled, therefore I visit the punishment of its iniquity upon it, and the land vomits out its inhabitants. In other words, there are certain sins, there are certain abominations that if you allow them to run rampant, that nature itself will rebel against you. And we can blame it on global warming all we want, and you can change your light bulbs till the cows come home. Go to Numbers. Chapter 35. Now this is the, the book of oranges and Genesis and where God's forming a nation with the patriarchs and, uh, and you know, they're dying off and Moses comes up and he's got to lead the people to the land, to the promised land. And I want you to listen to what God says and I want you to see how important this is to God. See, one of the reasons why the church does not fight abortion 
is because most of us are ignorant of how this impacts God himself, the very God we say we love and serve. See, most of the time we talk about the baby, and we talk about the mother, and we talk about society, but how many Christians actually know how this sinful, abominable act impacts the God we are worshiping? and what he thinks about it, and what he feels about it. How many? Not many. But this is what he said. So you shall not pollute the land where you are. For blood defiles the land, and no atonement can be made for the land, for the blood that is shed on it, except by the blood of him who shed it. I mean, no, that's pretty scary. Did you hear what he said? He says, if your nation sheds innocent blood, and by the way, when you shed innocent blood, the Bible says over and over and over again, you are polluting and defiling your own land. And he said, now listen, he said, the only way the land, the land can be cleansed is if you shed the blood of those who shed that blood. In fact, God was so adamant. Listen, when they went into the land, they had to create six separate cities called the cities of refuge to make sure that Israel did not violate the doctrine of blood guiltiness. Now think about that. Do you know what it takes to build a city? That's a lot of planning. That's a lot of resources. That is a lot of effort. And God says you're going to have to set apart six in this nation. Now he didn't say that for committing acts of adultery, committing acts of fornication, or any other sin on the planet. In other words, this is so crucial. In the priority of Almighty God, that when they're going into the promised land, you've got to build specific cities to protect this nation from shedding innocent blood. Because there were certain things like accidental death and things of this nature, and, and there is an avenger of blood, and so... You know, if something happens and we're not quite sure if there's innocence or guilt, you get these people to the cities of refuge, you sort it out. And if they're innocent, you take them home and you protect them. And if they're guilty, they are put to death. And by the way, in the Old Testament, there were probably about 18 capital offenses that required capital punishment. But there's only one, and this is very critical, there is only one offense where there is no ransom, there's no acquittal. And that is the sin and crime of murder. Some people think that that's against the sort of the pro-life ethic. How in the world could you be for the death penalty? It's because I'm a Bible-believing Christian that actually studies the scriptures. Guys, listen, some people think that's a contradiction. God is so pro-life, and I know that's a bad term with the abolitionists, but he is so pro-life that if somebody with malice and forethought takes the life of another, he automatically forfeits his own. Well, that's Going into the land. All right, let's press on. Oh, this is a doozy. Let's turn to Psalm 106. This right here will, will reveal the root of why we're in the condition we are in in the United States more than any other scripture I'm going to be preaching on here today. Could I have some of that water over there? Psalm 106. Listen very carefully to this. We'll 
We'll start in verse 34. They did not destroy the peoples concerning the, whom the Lord had commanded them, but they mingled with the Gentiles and they learned their works. They served their idols, which became a snare to them. Now watch this. They even sacrificed their sons and their daughters, everybody say it, to what? Demons. So when you shed innocent blood in the land, not only is your land polluted and defiled, not only is there a cry for God to judge those who are slaying you, what else are you doing? You're nourishing the demonic realm. Is it just me? When you look at this generation of young people raised in the United States of America, what are you seeing? They, they're even giving you the physical manifestation of the inward reality of demonic possession. They're tattooing everything that could be tattooed. They're piercing everything they can pierce. They're cutting themselves. They're screaming in torment. What in the world have we unleashed upon this nation? When we give our children and we sacrifice them, it nourishes the demonic realm. They do it to demons. It goes on to say, the blood of their sons and their daughters whom they sacrificed to the idols of Canaan and the land was polluted with the blood. Thus they were defiled by their own works and played the harlot by their own deeds. Now what I'm about to say here is unthinkable to most American Christians. Therefore the wrath of the Lord was kindled against his own people. How many believe or don't believe that God could get upset with his own people? Is it possible? Yes. How many would actually believe that though? Amen. Yes. So that he abhorred his own inheritance. Now watch this. And he gave them over to the hand of the Gentiles and those that hated them ruled over them. You want to know why the condition of Washington, D.C., it doesn't matter if it's Republican or a Democrat or an Independent. Do you wonder why our nation is so sick from the top of its head to the bottom of the soles of its feet? Do you want to know why God's people are being subject to tyranny and unjust laws? Look no further than abortion. God says, if you sacrifice children unto devils and you shed innocent blood, that act angers me. And what does my anger actually look like in reality, like in nations where you live? Those that hate you are going to rule over you. Who is Obama? Who is this fraud that has been perpetrated on the United States of America and just, just grinding us to the dirt? Who is this man? I'm going to tell you who this man is. He's God's man. He is not only the personification of evil, like, he's like the fourfold personification of evil. Abortion, homosexuality, Islam, and communism. All wrapped up to be our president. Do you know what? When God looks upon America, he sees Obama. That is what you have become in my eyes. He is your representative. He is God's man. And he ain't here to bless us. 
He's here to judge us. Those that hate you will rule over you. I wish I can go more into the Old Testament, but you get a little flavor of the doctrine of blood guiltiness. Let's go quickly to the New Testament. How much time do I have, guys? I'll try to do it in 10. All right, turn to Acts chapter 5. Now, I have studied the scriptures for over 30 years, and most of the time I never saw it through the grid of the doctrine of blood guiltiness, but when God opened my eyes and broke my heart over the plight of these children being butchered, it just leaped from the page everywhere I turned. The church is birthed, the kingdom has come, and the apostles are stirring it up. And they're proclaiming Christ, the Messiah. They're getting beaten up, lied about, jailed, martyred. And the battle is on. And in Acts 5.28, this is after... They were arrested, broken out of jail, and the angel tells them to go back there and do it again. They're going before the authorities of their day. In 528, it says this. This is, this is the authority speaking to the apostles, saying, did we not strictly command you not to teach in this name? Speaking about the name of Jesus. And look, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to do what? Say it, say it out loud. Bring this blood. To bring this man's blood upon us. Now you remember, and this is a very serious thing. You remember when Christ was being crucified, what did the Jews say? Let his blood, what? Be upon us and upon our children. And you wonder why the Jews have suffered for 2,000 years? Now listen, I, I've read through the books of Acts so many times. And, and even when I came to this passage, I, I thought, oh, okay, man, they're, they're upset about the name of Jesus. And they think this doctrine is dangerous. And they don't want Jerusalem to be contaminated by it. But what you, you know what I never saw? I never saw that last part. You know what you guys are trying to do? You're trying to bring this man's blood upon us. Now, why would the Jewish courts make that kind of statement? What did they know that most of us don't know today? One of the things they knew, they knew the Old Testament. All these scriptures I gave you in the Old Testament, they knew those, those, those teachings, these doctrines, these statesmen, these statutes. In fact, Remember Peter on the day of Pentecost, the great Pentecostal message? That day, 3,000 souls were birthed into the kingdom and added to the church. And I read that so many times and longed for God to do it again, even in our day. And you know, and I, I just thought, you know, it, it, it was just the, the messianic promises and just combined with the outpouring of the Holy Ghost and, and together was such a dynamic witness that surely that was the reason why they cried out, men and brethren, what can we do? What must we do to be saved? And I still hold to that today. But you know what I didn't get? Peter were holding them accountable to the doctrine of blood guiltiness. You, listen, they didn't do it. They were not culpable. It was Rome. It was the Jewish uh, people, the, 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 the government of the day. They were the ones that crucified Jesus Christ. They were the ones physically that shed his blood. But Peter held the entire crowd responsible for the death. And he told them, you have shed the blood of the just one. You with lawless hands. Speaking of the crowd. You with lawless hands. Crucified the Lord of glory. What was that audience? Was that audience Gentiles? They were what? 
Jews. So when they heard that, what do you think they might be thinking? If they're consenting, right? Uh, Jeremiah, I, I didn't go there, but Jeremiah chapter 26, write it down. Go to Jeremiah chapter 26, write it down. He said, listen, I'm only speaking what God told me to give you. My life is in your hands. And you can surely take it. But you better know this. If you kill me, my blood is going to be upon you, the city, and all the inhabitants of the land. Think about that. That's just one man. If you murder me in my obedience to God, you just better know you're going to fall under this judgment of blood guiltiness. And it's not only going to impact those who put their hand to do this. It's going to impact the city it was done and all the inhabitants of the land. That's for one man. What do you think America has accrued right now before a holy God when we have butchered up to 57 million children made in his image? Do we have any idea what's been stored up for us? These Jews knew those scriptures. Now I understand a little bit more why they cried out, men and brethren, what can we do? We're guilty. We're guilty. You're right. We're guilty. We, we killed him. We murdered him. We shed his blood. How can we escape? Repent and believe the gospel. See, most preachers today, pastors, they, see, they don't understand this doctrine. And they don't know how it's applicable in the Old and New Testament. They think, listen, they think to preach against abortion or child sacrifice or the shedding of innocent blood, they actually believe it's detracting from the gospel. Are you kidding me? Apart from its truth and reality, there's no urgency to repent. We shed the blood of the just one. We're guilty. And how do we get this guilt off of us? Repent. And believe the gospel. Well, the Jews pressed on in their defiance. And in Matthew chapter 23, this is what Jesus says to them. Therefore, indeed, I send you prophets, wise men, and scribes, and some of you will kill and crucify, and some of them you will scourge in your synagogues and persecute from city to city, that on you may come all the righteous blood shed on the earth, from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, the son of Berkiah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. And in Matthew 23, you know it, brothers and sisters, that's where Jesus just... just denounces Israel to its core. And these are one of the last things he is saying to them. Now think about it. He's, in, he's holding this entire generation accountable for all the blood of the righteous prophets, the saints, the martyrs. They're being held accountable to this doctrine. They never did repent. And in 70 AD, Titus came rolling in and decimated the entire nation. Just raised it to the ground. As our Lord said, not one stone left upon another. One million Jews were killed and another million went into captivity. How many know both Old and New Testament, this is a very serious situation with the Almighty. The doctrine of blood guiltiness. It's both in the Old Testament, it's in the New Testament. So I'm going to leave you with this, because I don't want to leave you hopeless. Okay, but we do, we, listen, 
It doesn't help us when we got cancer inside of our bodies and pretend like we don't have it and we'll avoid the doctor. Right? That's how I'm going to die. I know how I'm going to die. I'm going to die like most men. I ain't going to the doctor. That's, you know, that's how we are. But, you know, I got to pass out. I got to be sprawled out there. And they got to drag me there. But it's important when you have a terminal disease, and America has it, that we go to sweet Dr. Jesus. Because we need healing, folks. We need healing. Amen? So let's, let's turn to Isaiah chapter 1. And I'll conclude with this. Are we all okay on time, guys? Okay. I do want to respect everybody's time. Getting there. Isaiah chapter 1 says this. Now remember the background of this. Israel is a nation that once honored God. They still kept up, kept up their religious activities, but their hearts were far from God. And they became a land that sacrificed their children and shed innocent blood. That's how Isaiah chapter 1 starts off. Okay? To the point that God did not any longer put his endorsement or his approval upon their religious activities. He simply would not show up. He boycotted his own religion. <laughs> he talks about lifting their hands that he wouldn't see it, that he wouldn't answer their prayers, though they be many, be said, because your hands are full of blood. And whether we like this or not, brothers and sisters, you may not never had an abortion, but you live in a nation that does. And I do want to make one distinction here. How many are truly saved by the Spirit of the living God? You know you have eternal life. Listen, guys. The blood of Christ speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. Abortion may not affect your personal salvation. And I don't believe it does. But this is a national sin that is bringing national calamity upon us all, whether Christian or or non-Christian. Okay? Now, in light of this, this is what God says. Wash yourselves by the blood of Jesus Christ, by the washing of the water of your word. Make yourselves clean. Put away the evil of your doing from before my eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Now, watch this. Seek justice rebuke the oppressor, defend the fatherless, plead for the widow. Three things. How many want to get out from under God's judgment and wrath when it comes to blood guiltiness? Anybody besides me would like to spare this nation God's judgment and wrath. Well, Brother Chet talked about, we can't talk about the breach, we can't talk about the gap, we can't write books about it and sing songs about it. We actually need people standing in the gap. Literally standing in the gap. Remember like, like, like Aaron and Moses when the plague you know, broke out and people are dying. Moses says to Aaron, get the censor, go, buddy, run in the midst of them. Get right there. Stand between the living and the dead. Stand there. Stand there. Stand between the living and the dead. Stand there. And when he stood there, the plague stopped. The judgment stopped. See, everybody wants revival in the United States of America, but the church does not want to take on the Molochs and the Baals. And before God rescued Israel from the Midianites, Gideon, take down that idol. So what does he say? 
we got to repent. Everybody say repent. repent. On the behalf of ourselves and our nation, we have to rebuke the oppressors. And that means not only the ones who are shedding the innocent blood, but the government authorities that allow it. Guys, this is not rocket science. Ahab had an Elijah. David had a Nathan. Herod had a John the Baptist. What does that mean? There is this relationship between church and state. Right? And when the civil government becomes tyrannical and idolatrous, what does God do? He raises up a prophetic witness. That is not lawful. Stop it in Jesus' name. America, you are staggering under the weight of blood guiltiness. It has stained you. It has defiled you. It has polluted you. It has unleashed violence upon you. It has unleashed tyranny and injustice upon you. And after all that, if you repent, if you rebuke, and if you rescue, and if you obey me, I'll make it whiter then snow. Listen, Psalm 106, it didn't end with just God getting angry and turning you over to those who hate you. That's where we're at. But you know what it says right after Psalm 106? It says, when they came under oppression, listen. And there were many times where God said, listen, I'm done with you. You have committed so much idolatry. You're in trouble. Hey, talk to your idols. See if they'll deliver you. I'm done. I ain't doing this no more. You have betrayed me too many times. I'm not doing this anymore. But you know what? God will see the plight of his people even after he told them he wouldn't deliver them. He came and he rescued them time and time again. He is a loving, long-suffering, and patient God. He truly, truly is. I would not be here if that was not the case. Believe me, I have tempted him to the nth degree. But the Bible says in Psalm 106, when his people cried, when they cried out, when they were being oppressed because of their sins and their abominations, God heard the cry, remembered the covenant, and restored them in the land. And how many want that for our future? Amen. Well, folks, we got to deal with this root. I'm telling you, we can do lower magistrate, we can do all these stuff, and they're very, very important. But I'm going to tell you this, until we deal with the root, God ain't dealing with the fruit. We got to get the acts of God's truth and apply it to the root of this bloody, idolatrous tree. And then the Midianites will be pushed back. And freedom and liberty will return to the United States of America. God bless you.